all just bow in prayer. Let's unite our hearts before the Lord, our Heavenly Father, and our blessed God. Once again, we draw near to Thy throne and into Thy presence, praying that Thou wilt abide with us as we have gathered for worship. And from this moment right through this entire time, may the Lord be glorified, and may our hearts be subdued before Thee, and may we hear Thy voice to us, we pray in the Saviour's name and for His glory. Amen. time and let's all bow together in prayer and seek the Lord's face once more and we want to still ourselves and prepare our hearts and minds to hear the word of God and let us all do so now and every Christian pray for the Lord's help, the Lord's blessing. Let's all seek him together. Heavenly Father, we come to thee again. We bow down in thy presence in the name of thy sons, our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank Thee for Him. We thank Thee for the great doctrine of His coming. We rejoice that it is an inseparable and integral part of the gospel. We thank Thee that it will be the consummation of Thy work and Thy people, that they will be raised up and will be transformed, that the entire body of the saints from all time will be glorified as one body glorified together. O oh Lord, this is the promise of Thy Word, and this is what has been purchased for us by Christ. And we pray this day that Thou wilt write these truths upon our hearts. So hear us now, and bless us, we pray, as we continue before Thee. Give help to preach and help to hear. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for His glory. Amen and amen. Now turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We're going to look at the final part of this chapter. We have been in it already last week, and I return to it again. I'm not going to have any set reading at this point, but because we're looking at different verses here in the message today. But please open your Bibles to this 12th chapter of Daniel. Now, 
what we have in the final three chapters of this book is what is called a Christophany, one of the Lord's pre-incarnate appearances. He continues, therefore, to address Daniel when he had come to meet with him, as we find in chapter 10. And that address continues right into this last chapter. All that Christ says to Daniel in this passage was not only future to the prophet, but so much of it remains in the future for the church today. As you read these verses and ponder them, you will find that the word end is used a number of times, and it's found in various verses. Twice there is the phrase, for example, the time of the end, in verse 4 and in verse 9. Then in verse number 6, the angel asks the question, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? That could also be read this way, until how long is the end of wondrous things? And then in verse number 7, we have these words, all these things shall be finished. And that could be read, all these things shall come to an end. We've already noted that this statement in verse 7 is made in relation to that period of tribulation or oppression for the Lord's people, that final tribulation that the Lord himself not only mentions here to Daniel, but that he draws to our attention in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, where in verse 21 he refers to the tribulation, the great tribulation, and goes on to speak of it, bringing or ushering in his very coming immediately after the tribulation of those days, he says, then he will come. And so we have in uh, these words a reference to that time, that time of great tribulation. That is here in verse number 7. Then in verse 13 of Daniel 12, we have another little term that uses the word end. And there the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uses this expression, the end of the days. The end of the days. And as we will see later, by the Lord's help in this message, the reference is actually there to the closing days of this age, the end of the world, or the end of the age as the Lord speaks of it in Matthew 28 and verse number 20. So all these verses refer to the end. And on the basis of consistency, these references to the end have to do with the closing times of this age that precedes the coming again of our Savior, the second advent of the blessed Savior of men. In the course of history, various uh, commentators have ascribed the contents of these verses in Daniel 12 to different periods. Among some, there is the view that what the Lord says in Daniel 12 has to do with that man I've already referred to, Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled about 170 years before the Lord's first coming. Now, undoubtedly, he is mentioned in this vision, and especially in chapter 11, as I showed you some weeks ago. And Antiochus did rise, he did reign, and he persecuted the Lord's people, or persecuted the Jews very, very severely. But you see, in that he stands as a foreshadowing of the final Antichrist, as I explained to you who will persecute the saints at the time of the end, at the end of the age, according to the teaching of Christ and the teaching of Paul and the teaching of the Apostle John. And so Antiochus is seen here as a type or a foreshadowing of the man of sin himself. And we cannot confine what we have here to Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived before the Lord ever came the first time. It doesn't make any sense. There are others who uh, take a post-millennial view, and they ascribe these last verses of Daniel to 70 AD. They do the same with Matthew 24. They ascribe what we have here to the events of that time when the Roman armies under Titus, the Roman emperor, destroyed Jerusalem, that is in 70 AD, and raised the temple to the ground. Now, there is reference to the destruction of the temple in Matthew and in other Gospels, undoubtedly. 
Indeed, the Lord himself made it very clear that not one stone would be left upon another as you read Matthew 24. But you cannot confine Matthew 24 completely to 70 AD because then it makes no sense. Because I've shown you today, it goes on to say that after the tribulation, they will say that is the destruction of Jerusalem. The Lord will come and the heavens will shake. And that didn't happen in 70 AD. And he will resurrect his people from the dead. And that didn't happen in 70 AD. And so to ascribe this passage to 70 AD or any other prophetic passage and say it was all fulfilled then, again, makes no sense. This passage decidedly takes us to the very end of this age. Now that is not to say that everything here in Daniel 12 is easy to interpret. And in particular, the references that we find in these verses with regard to the time period, such as the 1290 days or the 1335 days. There are all kinds of views about the meaning of those terms, many, many views by many, many good men, but the very fact that there are many views of what those two time periods actually indicate is sufficient for you and I to say to ourselves, well, that means that they're not clear. Because if they were as clear as each man says, then there would be no difficulty. But when you get good men, godly men, coming to different views on the meaning of the 1290 or the 13 and 35 days, that tells you right away it is not as clear as some would tell you or say. And so that should cause us to approach terms like these with regard to time with caution and indeed with humility, not with dogmatism. And that is especially to be noted when we consider the warning, the caveat that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to Daniel in this passage, when he says, the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end, which means that the meaning and the understanding of much of what we have here will only become clear as we approach that time. And that in itself makes it, therefore, very evident that we must not be dogmatic on what these days may signify. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, informs Daniel here that nothing more would be revealed. And so the Lord's people, as I said last week, are not to pry into matters that are not revealed to them. But what we are to do is to await the coming of the Lord. And let me say this. Whatever is going to happen will be unfolded as we get closer to the end of the times and the coming of the Lord draws nigh. It will all become more and more clear as time goes on. Whenever the Lord came the first time, it was only when that event took place that prophecies about the first coming then became clear. And I believe with all my heart that the same will be true with regard to prophecies regarding the time of the end. But the one thing that we do learn from this passage is that what we are to do is to have a certain focus. I, I showed you this last week. I posed a question. What does the Lord want the people of God to do as we await His coming? We know He's coming. There's no doubt about that. So what are we to do while we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a pattern for living revealed to us in these verses as we await the Son of God from heaven. And last week I showed you one particular aspect of the focus that we must have, and that is we are to focus on the preeminence of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a truth that girds our souls, that governs our thinking, that safeguards all true theology, the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, it safeguards the doctrine of eschatology, the second coming of the Lord, last things. If we get into our minds that the Lord is preeminent over all, I showed it to you last week, from these verses, He's preeminent over the nations, over the angelic world, over time and history. That's all very clear in this passage. And we thank God for the clarity of it. 
There are two other aspects of that focus that we must have as we await the Lord's coming that I didn't have time to consider last week. So we will do that today. And so moving on, therefore, we're taught from this passage that we must focus on the program of Christ. Because as Daniel, with his eyes fixed on the man clothed in linen who was above the waters, and we saw all that that means, as he focused on this, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ set before Daniel a program with how he was to live out the rest of his days before he died. And from that, you and I are able to glean this program for our living, for our way of behavior, for our pilgrimage, for our sojourning in the world as we await the end. I don't know when it will be. We all could be very well gone before the end will come. The Lord knows that. That's in His keeping. But we are to live in a certain way. And here's another aspect of it, a program that the Lord sets before us. Now, there are different features to this program of Jesus Christ. It's a program of prayer. Look with me at verse number 8. And this is a, an interesting verse. We know I explained to you last week uh, the setting of it. And it says, I heard that as Daniel heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And there, brethren and sisters, you have a man in prayer. That is a prayer. O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He's praying in relation to the end. And I see something there that I find in the Gospels. I find my Savior saying to His disciples and to us today as well as here that as we await the coming of the Lord, we are to be much in prayer. The Lord said in Mark chapter 13 and verse 33, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Or Luke 21 and verse number 36, the Lord said to the disciples this, and he says it to us today, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to pray. We could also go to what Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 18. And in that verse... The apostle is describing, remember what I called it when I referred to it some weeks ago, the battle of the ages. It's referred to in Daniel. It's referred to by the apostle Paul as he talks about the warfare. And he tells the church that we are to take on to us the whole armor of God. And he shows that there's a, there is an armor. There's the panoply of God, as the word means, by which we are equipped completely and fully in order to stand in the evil day, the battle of the ages. But as Paul goes down through those pieces of the Christian armor, he comes to the great climax in verse number 18, where he says, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And so, brethren and sisters, we need to catch the import the meaning of these verses, these statements from Christ, the one who is coming, the one who will return, urges his people to prayer. One thing is certain. I can say this today without any, uh, any fear of contradiction. We are closer to the end than we have ever been before. I mean the whole church of God. With every passing day, we are always a day closer to the end. And men and women, brethren and sisters, that should stir our souls with the need to lay hold upon the Lord. Daniel prayed as he was told about the end, and his cry was, what shall be the end of these things? And the Lord says, as I've just quoted from his own words, watch and pray as you as the church comes toward the end of time. Here's Daniel entering into communion with the Lord. Do you notice the wisdom of this? He hears things that are of the most momentous kind. And he gets before the Lord and he begins to pray and he asks this question and he enter, enters into communion with the Lord. Notice how it begins, O oh my Lord. Here's a man of God 
Here's a man with a personal relationship with Christ. How fundamental that is. There is no possibility of having a relationship with the Lord unless there is this this statement, Oh my Lord, can you say that today? Can you get before God and say, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? It's fundamental. You cannot have a program of prayer unless this relationship and communion with the Lord actually exists. And it must not only be there, but it must be maintained. And Daniel, remember, what's he called? Daniel was a man of prayer. He stands out in his own book as a man of prayer. Maybe above everything else, a prophet, yes, a preacher, a wise man, a great man, a man involved at the highest levels of society in the politics of his day, but above all else, a man who knew God in the place of prayer. Daniel 6, there you have it. We saw it months ago where he goes to his own house when he hears that the decree is drawn up that no man is to pray to anyone except to the king. And Daniel goes with his windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prays three times as he did a four time. He keeps up with the life of prayer. And also in chapter 9, that great chapter which records the marvelous prayer that he prayed when he had read the writings of Jeremiah, and he set himself to pray. And therefore, here's a man who at the very end of the book is still praying. Oh, my dear friend, there's the Lord's program for his church as they wait his coming. It's to get to the place of prayer. It's to get into a communion with God. As you think about these words, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Here's a man, let's put it this way, he's searching for more light. Is that not what we should be doing as we come before the Lord? Praying over the times? Oh yes, not asking the Lord to reveal to us the date of His coming. No, not that, for that's not going to happen. But asking for light. If you take those very words, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now I know that Daniel there is looking at the end of all things. But to take those words in another way, just lift them out of their context for a moment. Would we not find ourselves in our day and time asking that question from another perspective? Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things, these things that are happening every day in our nation and in our province especially? Lord, what's the end going to be if wicked men get their way? What's going to happen to our freedoms and our liberties if men who have risen up and who are, who are out to destroy us get their way? What will the end be? You could ask the question that way. In other words, as we are in perilous times and dark days, we need to come before the Lord and search for further light and set our minds and our hearts before God. There would need to be that, a setting of ourselves to seek God for light for the future, for the future of His work, for the future and the well-being of our children, for the future prosperity of the gospel. Do you ever think about those matters? Those are the things that really count. Not what's going to happen, who'll be in power. That's important in its own place. But taking precedence above that, Lord, what will be the end of these things if you don't step in and you don't turn things around with a mighty move of the Holy Ghost? What is going to happen to thy work? What is going to happen to our children and our grandchildren? What will be the end of these things concerning them? What will be the future of the gospel in our land if there is not a moving of the Holy Ghost? Those are matters concerning which you and I should be searching before God. And Daniel's prayer, you will notice, was very similar to the angels in verse 6. 
where the angel asked a, a kind of a similar question. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, that is exactly an angel speaking to Christ, and the angel asked, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And now Daniel, answered, uh, Daniel asks a similar question. And what I learned from that is, just in a, a way of applying it to our hearts today, again I say, we're not prying into the future, we're not listening to some person who says, I've got all the answers, and then we start to make similar inquiries? No. But I'm looking here at it from this perspective, a program of prayer, and listening to those who are in touch with God, and then learning from them, and seeking God along the same line, seeking for his mind and his help and his will. My dear friend, for that to happen, and I want to underline this today, for you to learn to pray from the people of God, you need to be among the people of God when they get to prayer. Isn't that right? The Bible makes that very clear. Christians need to be taught to pray. That was the prayer of the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. They were men of prayer already, but they knew their limitations, and they knew just how weak they were, and they listened to the Lord pray, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And have you ever felt that when you've been in a prayer meeting, and a man of God lays hold upon the Lord, and your heart is stirred, and you feel the power of his praying, and you say to yourself, Lord, teach me to pray. But for that to happen, you need to be in the prayer meeting. You see, let us at all levels encourage each other, learn from each other to seek the face of God. I draw your attention to the words that you find in Zechariah 8. I'm not going to turn to them, but it's a well-known passage. Zechariah 8, verse 21, where you have one believer saying to another, Let us go to pray. I will go also. And there's one believer encouraging another believer to get to the prayer meeting and seek the face of God. Now, may I apply it this way? Parents, do you ever bring your children to the prayer meetings of the church? Is the prayer meeting a foreign thing to your family? And maybe... They've come now to their teenage years, and you're having difficulties because, well, let me just make it very clear, put it very straight. You didn't bring them to the prayer meetings when they were little, and now you wonder why they'll not go to the prayer meetings when they get into their teenage years. Parents have a serious responsibility to get their families into the atmosphere of prayer, that they may hear Men of God pray. I will never forget what my mother said to me shortly after I was saved. It was shortly after I was saved we came to this church. And I began to attend the Monday night prayer meeting as it was along with my brother. And she said, that is great. That will do you good. And so it did. And I can remember men of God who are now in glory, some of them. As they laid hold upon God, and my heart was stirred, and I listened to them pray, and I learned so much from them, because as they were praying, God was teaching them and leading them out. And Christian, you can't afford not to be in the prayer meeting Whenever you're able to get there, you can't afford not to be there. Let us encourage one another, parents and children. And may I also go a little farther, spouses, encourage one another. And I say this because we live in days when husbands and wives need to be in the place of prayer. If they're able, if they're free, and the children are up or whatever, both there together. Or, as I've said so many times, set up a rota. Little ones, well, they have to go to their beds. But are you doing your duty? Husband, are you making time for your wife? Making sure you get home as much as you can and say, it's your turn to go tonight. I'll, I'll do the dishes. I'm not being funny here. 
I'll help out. You need to be in the prayer meeting and vice versa. This is what is needed. We can talk and we can grumble and we can mourn about the state of our land. But until the church of God gets down to getting before God in the place of prayer, we may mourn until we're blue in the face. But it will not make one whit of difference. Members encouraging one another. Do you ever do that? I was speaking on Tuesday night about Paul going to, as a prisoner to Rome. And when he was about 40 miles from Rome, a group of Christians out of the church in Rome came to meet him. And it says that when Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took courage. That's the best way to encourage one another, is to show an interest in one another's spiritual well-being. And one of those ways is to encourage each other to get to the place of prayer. And so, here's the program of prayer. There's also the program of pursuing God's will in these verses. I'll keep moving on here. And you will find this is part of this focus on Christ's program. Not only prayer, but pursuing God's will. Look at verse 9. And notice these words. And he said that as Christ said, Go thy way, Daniel. Then verse 13, but go thou thy way. I'll come back to that verse a little later by the help of the Lord. But notice here what the Lord is doing. This actually came in answer to Daniel's prayer. He said, Lord, what will be the end of these things? And the Lord responds by saying to Daniel, Daniel, go thy way. In other words, the Lord did not answer Daniel in the way that maybe Daniel thought he would answer him, but he did answer him. And he said, Daniel, go your way. You know what that means? Literally, those words actually read this way in verse 9. Go, Daniel. And what's he telling Daniel to do? Daniel, get back to work. Get back to work. Carry on with your role in Babylon where you have been placed by me. You see, the Lord sometimes withholds information from his people. And certainly did it here. He didn't tell Daniel about the end very much at all. Or he didn't give him any dates. Or he's never going to do that. But he does tell the church. Here's my program. Pursue my will by living out your life. As a Christian, as a follower of me, get back to your work, carry on with your daily occupation. You know, you might wonder, well, how do you apply this? Well, in the extreme sense, let me tell you how I apply it. And perhaps some of you have read of this because it's happened so often. There have been people in history who have set dates for the Lord's coming, and because they have insisted that they have found the answer, there were enough, uh, what's the word? gullible people to believe it. And they stopped their work. And they sold their businesses. And then, of course, the Lord didn't come and they had egg in their face. But more than that, they had done great damage to God's work. I remember my, I mentioned my mother there. I remember my father telling me a long time ago about cottage meetings that he attended as he was growing up in the area where he lived. And there was this man would come to speak now and then, a very sincere man. But he would say, last night, and this is how he put it, last night me and Lizzie had a dream. He and his wife, the both of them had a dream. He didn't say Lizzie and I, he got the grammar wrong, but me and Lizzie had a dream. And in this dream, the Lord was coming soon, and that man didn't put in his crop that year. And he became the laughing sport of the whole district where he lived. Now, those things do happen, unfortunately. But God says to you and me today, while you're waiting for my coming, you pray. And furthermore, you get on with your earthly life, your legitimate business. You continue on, in other words, living for God 
as he wants you to do. You see, there's a wee verse in Deuteronomy that really helps us here. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And that includes the coming of Christ. The secret things. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. I say again to you, the Lord does not explain many, many things to his people. He keeps them hidden. There are the secret things, and they belong to the Lord and to him only. But then there's, I'll put it this way, there's enough revealed to keep you busy every day. To have you walk with God and your family and your children and serve the Lord. And what I want you to notice is, you're in this world on display before the unconverted. And what should be seen in your life is that every day you trust God and you are serving God. That's what God's telling Daniel. Go, Daniel, you get back to your work. You serve me there. And the prophecy is now over. It's all finished as far as you're concerned. Get back to your work. Isn't that a fascinating truth that we find here in the light of all the silly things and the nonsensical events that take place in the realm of people preaching about the second coming and all it leads to? Ah, my friend, here's God's program. But then there's a third thing here about this program on which we're to focus. It's a program of purity. Look at verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. And those words all speak of purity. And I know that in the context here, the reference is to the persecution and to the tribulation as a result of which God does purify his people. We might might ask the question, why do believers suffer trial? Why does tribulation come? Why does the church go through tribulation in every generation? Why do Christians have troubles on the personal level every day? Why are we sick? Why do people let us down? Why are all these troubles in our lives? Because God uses them to purify his people. And he's saying here that as a result of this tribulation, many will be purified, as it says in verse 10, and white and tried. And so the reference is to God's use of these things to sanctify his people. But here's the point, brethren and sisters. Let me quote to you what Paul said to the Thessalonian church. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now Daniel had been in the lion's den, as we know from chapter 6. The lion's den experience, severely tried in that manner. But whatever the time or the point in the history of God's church in this world, the Lord allows all these things to happen for the purpose of purifying and making white his people through their trials. And we must keep that in mind because God wants us to live a holy life. That's his will. That's his, that's his mind. There's nothing clearer than that. Among many other things that are so clear, here's one of them. We are to live holy lives in this world. And that's why God puts us through the fire. Notice what that verse goes on to say, verse number 10. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Now notice that. Even as God's people live holy lives, the wicked will still do wickedly. And the reason why they do wickedly is because they don't understand. You see, the wicked of this world, they are in darkness. They have no understanding of sin. They have no understanding of their wickedness. They have no understanding of their eternal danger. They are in blindness spiritually. And therefore the wicked will do wickedly even when God's people are living holy lives. Because the wicked do not understand. And it should be no surprise to the people of God that the wicked live as they live. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be filled with amazement when they spout out and they spew out 
their mouthings against the Lord and against his people. We shouldn't be surprised when they lie and when they, and when they uh, seek to fabricate stories and, and all of this. It goes on all the time. But why are you surprised? What's happening? You are simply seeing a manifestation of what's in here. They're the wicked. Therefore, they'll do wickedly. But while they do their wickedness, that does not mean that we're to copy them. We're to do the very opposite. And this has been always the problem. The Lord's people have not lived as they should. The world's influences creeps up, creep up. And they begin to follow suit with the world, become like the world. Let me turn you to a verse in Exodus that really ties in here. Exodus chapter 10. Look with me at verse 21 and verse 23. Exodus 10, it's the plague of darkness. Exodus 10, verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And this was a physical darkness, yes. And Moses stretched forth his hand, and it tells us there was this thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But listen to these words, brethren and sisters. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Do you see that? Here's the plague of darkness over the whole land of Egypt. But on every Israelitish home, there's light. There's light. Now, do you see what I'm saying from Daniel 12? The Lord says to his people, be a pure people. The wicked will do wickedly, but you be pure. They don't understand. They're in darkness. You're not in darkness. It says there, the wise shall understand. And there it is. You've got light in your dwelling. You've got light in your soul. You have got an understanding of the things of God. Therefore, live the way the Lord wills that you should live. as a program of purity as we wait the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, that's the way it ought to be. For many reasons as I'm showing you. But here's another one. When the Lord comes, it's to bring the final sanctifying work into the hearts of His people, into their very bodies. And in the light of that, what manner of people ought we to be? As Peter puts it in his last chapter of his second epistle, in all godliness and honesty, this is what's been spoken about here. And then it's a program of perseverance. For notice, another thing here that Daniel is told by the Lord. It says in verse 11, from that, from, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination shall make desolate set up, for the maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. What I want to do from those words is just what I've said, a program of perseverance. Because what's in view here? in the sense of the prophecy that is in this passage, is what's going to happen toward the end of time as we read these words. These things are going to happen someday. But what I want us to see from this verse is how we can apply it to ourselves today. The sacrifice taken away, what is that? Well, it's an attack upon the atonement. It's an attack upon the gospel. If you even confine it to the Jewish uh, sacrifices. Those sacrifices were a foreshadowing and a, and, a, and, a, and a manifestation of the gospel. The daily sacrifice taken away. And, and yet, the Lord says here that we are to persevere. He says to Daniel, go your way, Daniel. Many shall be purified amid white and tried. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, Daniel, you must persevere even when the gospel is under attack. And then it mentions the abomination that maketh desolate. And that is Antichrist setting himself up against God. As we saw from 2 Thessalonians 2. What does the Lord tell the people of God to do? He tells us to persevere. For, look at verse 12. Here's where I see it, the perseverance. Blessed is he 
that waiteth. So, are we not living a day when the gospel's under attack? When they want to take away the sacrifice? When they want to replace it with a, a false gospel? When we are seeing men elevate themselves against God? We're living in those times. And they'll become, they will become worse as time goes by. But what does the Lord say to you and me today? Blessed is he that waiteth. That's perseverance. And you think carefully about that. Blessed is he that waiteth. Remaining true to Christ. As dark days unfold, the gospel is under attack. They want to remove the atonement. They want to remove the cross. They want to do away with what we cherish. It's going on as I speak. And men are elevating themselves. And as I'm saying, it will become worse. And let me just give you an illustration of this. Let's get it right up to date. On what's happening in our times. Two weeks ago or thereabouts, the Presbyterian Church elected a new moderator for the incoming year. He was hardly more than the recipient of that vote. Then he made a statement that he relished a meeting with the Pope. The Pope's supposedly coming to Southern Ireland this year, and they're hoping to bring him up here. That's the agenda. And this new moderator of the Irish Presbyterian Church, which we've been told all the time is now a great church and it's so much changed. And he says, I relish a meeting with the Pope. Now, let's just think about that. He relishes a meeting with a person who takes the place of God on earth. That's his claim. He says that he is the vicar of Christ in this earth. And the Presbyterian moderator, moderator incoming wants to meet a man and relishes a meeting with a man who takes the place of Jesus Christ, who is God. This is a man who says that in a few words of his, a piece of bread becomes Jesus Christ. And the moderator-elect wants to have a meeting with him. This is a man who says he has control over all souls in that imaginary place called purgatory. And at one word of his, they could all be delivered. Of course, it's nonsense, but that's what he says. And this man from Bangor West Church, the new moderator incoming, wants to have a meeting with him. And I could keep on going. I'm telling you folk today, the same battle has to be fought. The same stand has to be taken. It doesn't matter what happens or how small we are. These are the things that are going on all around us. And as soon as I saw that, I got in touch with my brethren, and a statement was put in the paper last Saturday that we totally repudiate what this man said, relishing a meeting with the Pope. I do not understand Presbyterian people who say they are saved. I don't doubt that. But who can stay in a church where that is going on? A meeting with a man of sin. A meeting with the Antichrist in the visible church. That's what he's saying. This is the day we live in. But God says, blessed are those who wait. I was reading lately as well, so before I close here today, I still haven't got to my final point. But anyhow, last year in May, there was a meeting of European leaders, including all these fellows who are so much opposed to Britain leaving Brexit, or leaving Europe, this Brexit thing. All these European leaders, Juncker and all the rest of them. There was a major meeting late May last year, and Pope Francis was at it. And those leaders all said, virtually every one of them, here is the man whom we believe will be or could be our leader. Now that is very interesting. Very interesting. Because it gives an insight into what's happening in Europe. These are the days in which we live, folks. 
This is what God is showing us. As why I said a while ago, as things go, time goes on, you can't see things happening. And yet, here's God's program for you and me as his children. I meant to get to verse 13. And we're not only to focus on Christ's preeminence and Christ's program for our daily lives and our battle and our conflicts, but we're to focus on the promise that he gave Daniel and he gives to every one of us. Verse 13, But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of thy days, or the days. What is that? I just want to mention as I close. It's a wonderful verse. It is a promise from Christ to Daniel. Go thy way. We saw what that means. Get back to your work, Daniel. Get on with your life in Babylon and carry on faithfully. Go thy way till the end be. And that end is Daniel's death. And then the Lord says, For thou shalt rest. What is this? This is a man of God like Daniel, and a man of God like any man of God in time. And he lives, and he serves, and then he comes to the end of his days, and then he goes to his rest. Christ is promising Daniel here. Daniel, there's a moment, there's a day coming when you're going to rest from your labors. And nobody has any idea how long Daniel lived after this. He's now 90 or more, as we've seen so many times, but he lives on another wee while, whatever it may be. And then he comes to his rest. And that word rest is a wonderful word. It means to settle down, literally. But it's the same word from which you get the name Noah. Noah's name means rest or comfort. And so he's saying, Daniel, you're going to come to your Noah. You're going to come to your rest. You're going to come to your day when you will leave aside this world and you'll come into glory to be with me. That's what the Lord's talking about here. It's the very same thing as he says to every Christian or about every Christian. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord, for they shall rest from their labors. Revelation 14, 13 is the very same issue. But then there's resurrection here as well as rest. For he says to Daniel that you'll stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And the end of the days there is a reference obviously to the very end. And Daniel, you'll stand in your lot. The word lot means inheritance. And so the Lord's talking here about Daniel, to Daniel about what's going to happen one day. Daniel, you're going to go to your rest, you're going to die, and you'll rest in glory. Imagine that. Daniel's soul is resting in heaven with the Lord. His body's in the ground somewhere, the dust of the ground. But the Lord has promised Daniel, Daniel, you'll stand in your lot at the end of the days. You'll get your inheritance. And so will every child of God. What did Paul say to the Roman church? And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And what the Lord said through Paul to the Romans is being said here by Christ directly to Daniel. Daniel, you'll go to your rest, but at the end of the days, all the days of time, When I come back the second time, you will stand in your lot, your inheritance, along with all the saints. There's the Lord's promise. That's a great way for the book to end, isn't it? For Daniel to be shown these things. And every believer here today should take this to heart and think of what the Lord has for you Let us pray. Let's bow together before him. Let's unite our hearts. Heavenly Father, we ask thee today to bless thy word, to bring it home to us with freshness, power, with clarity, to help us to understand it, to help us to live by it, rejoice in it, and press on. Abide with us, O God. 
bless throughout the rest of this day. And all our gatherings may thy name be glorified. May Christ be exalted. May a great work be done. Help us in a, an evil age to stand for thee, for the gospel, for the things that are worth standing for, and to lift up thy blessed name. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen.